So one question we have is the, about the perception of calligraphy in your respective traditions or cultures, um, and also in your own family. Wondering, many of you, you know, you all kind of were were um, interested in the art form at a young age, and I'm curious as to how that was seen by your family, especially um, in a time now where a lot of of what we were occupied, preoccupied by economic concerns. <laughs> economic concerns. My parents, there's no way I was going to be an artist. Um, six children, none of us were going to be artists, but three of us ended up being artists. Uh, two lettering artists. My, my older brother is a sign painter. My older sister is an architect, which I probably would have been drawn to instead of lettering had it not been for a competitive atmosphere and she had architecture. <laughs> so, and within the family, um, when I got to the White House, my father still said, you're still going to do calligraphy? So, so that's the family part, but um, and yet they all appreciate it. So um, I'll stick with the family part and get into cultural after you guys answer your family influences yeah from i guess from my family i mean just it's probably common art is usually just something you do in kindergarten and then when math comes in second third grade it's like all right slowly start to fade that art away and you know i, I sucked at math right so i had to give up the art you know but you know i i lived um in back of um, um a railroad track area and they, you know they had these great walls that were just begging to get vandalized so you know that's where i got my you know graffiti right and you know using you know homemade tools of shoe polish and you know so that's kind of like where it was is you know honestly vandalism i remember you know taking um calligraphy too you know um in high school got a d you know because i couldn't sing the lines you know things like that but Eventually, you know, in terms of the family, I, I, it's probably just recent uh, until I started making money, until I got my very first piece. And, oh, okay, you know, it's not a lot. I'm not going to be a millionaire, you know, hopefully. But, um, but as soon as I started to um, have that, you know, economic value, right? And then, you know, the cultural stuff, you know, that will come. But, you know, especially with, uh, you know, with my father, you know, is like, all right, you know, it's good, a hobby, you know, good. But concentrate on, you know, your, your day job and all of that. But as soon as, you know, all right, you know, traveling a bit and, you know, starting to get some, and my mother, you know, started to get some press or something like that, then, all right, they kind of turn around. So um, now they're one of my biggest supporters. Yeah, I'm, I'm very lucky that I'm coming from artist kind of uh, family and they all supported me. Uh, my dad is um, a manager or, or was a manager of a huge company, so he was very left brain person and my mom is a poet and an artist so she has a very bright brain so I think growing up in that family I, I try try to make a balance and I'm really fortunate that I can ap apply both you know kind of management style you know skills and artistic skills in my life and um, but in terms of calligraphy I think um, as I was saying in the film calligraphy is really part of the you know Iranian society you learn it at school when you're a kid um, you learn it at uh, after school classes there's a huge Iranian association of calligraphers that teaches calligraphy in a in a very classical way and you have to go through classes and train with a master and you know you can obtain certificates at each point to become a master and I've heard that there are just two schools of calligraphy in the world um, that are teaching classical Islamic calligraphy in this way, and one is in Iran and one is in Turkey. So I was really, uh, you know, um, fortunate to be able to get exposed to those masters and uh, learn from them. And um, many of um, families have a couple of people who are, you know, learning calligraphy at least or or loving calligraphy and. You will see calligraphy in many people's uh, uh, dec um, as a decorating art. So um, I think they they consider calligraphy as as really art rather than you know a craft or um, something that is um, deal with just technicality. But it's really you know a regarded art. Thank you. And then in terms of cultural perceptions. Um, 
I know that, you know, he, in, in this country, I think calligraphy can be associated with like, you know, wedding invitations growing up, you know, this kind of invitation type of thing. Um, but then also, Christian, in your case, there was also sort of a an excavation that you had to do culturally to sort of bring something to the forefront. So could you both talk a little bit about the perceptions that you've worked with and against in your practice? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, I, I think it's interesting to hear Arash say that calligraphy is taught in the schools in, in Iran still to this day. Yeah, it's, um, it was when I graduated from high school in 1979, calligraphy was uh, considered a mandatory course in anybody who wanted to study commercial art in college, and those days are totally gone. Um, calligraphy, when I started professionally, there were... Uh, three studios in Washington, D.C. that employed anywhere four or five calligraphers, 40 hours a week, filling in certificates and diplomas and resolutions. All those studios are gone. So culturally, uh, through the digital age, we've seen a lot of this work change, a lot of it go away, but uh, it's opened up doors for, for this stuff that Charles Pierce and Thomas Engmeyer and this modern expression, expressionist movement of calligraphy. So. Um, I think it's it's broadened its usage in the United States through that, but it's not uh, taught formally at all. It was interesting to see that that's a nice part of the curriculum. And uh, Christian, it was interesting to see, I, I want to make sure I get this clear, you mentioned in your presentation that young people could read your language, which is an otherwise obsolete language that had gone the way of history. How did that happen? Yeah, so it... It happened because usually when when the internet age you know came out, a uh, flow of information. So um, and it, this goes along with the perception that you know you have this you know symbol, and you, I would have to say it came out of the tattoo culture because you, you're gonna if you want to have something permanently on your body, you're gonna make sure it's damn right, right? Because we've all seen you know you know oh that's supposed to say strength, but it says chicken fried rice, you know. <laughs> just for tattoo artists. So that forced people, Filipinos, to actually learn the very basics. And, you know, we kind of know the basics of language, strength, love, and all of those. And so th they would recognize it. Um, and, you know, in terms of the perception, the it, it, it mirrors the Filipino-American or Filipino experience. What you know, I was talking about as, as a kid going through this identity crisis, um, because the Philippines is a melting pot. You know, we have Filipinos who look white, have blonde hair, blue eyes. We have them that are black. Every you know that are that look Middle Eastern Indian. Um, and so, the question you know we would guess like, what are you, right? And that is also what happens with our writing system. Like, is that you know I've I've had folks say, is that terrorist writing? You know, it has happened, and that was just last year, right? And it's before this whole Trump thing, right? You know, we, is that, oh, because they associate things with culture, with writing. So, and if your culture is unknown, then your writing is unknown. So we have, myself and my peers, we have a lot of um, um, education that has to happen. But then we have to educate ourselves, educate our peers, and then, you know, try and figure out how to best perpetuate that and create systems and foundations for the next generation to do it. And, you know, that is the challenge and the opportunity there. Follow up to that. Um, has the work that's happened in diaspora influenced what's happening in the Philippines in terms of either the revival of the language or the preservation? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, usually, because we have a, um, a strong colonial mindset, so whatever happens in America, it starts off in America and then it makes its way back to the Philippines. Um, but then now, since you know, sometimes there is um, almost a, a separation, some static between you know, because who are you? You're appropriating your culture, even though you know you don't speak the language. You're rich. You live in San Francisco, and um, we live here. You know, we are the true Filipinos. But you know, so it happens. It's happening with the the, the tattoo traditions as well. Um, so any cultural traditions. You know, there's the dancing. You know, while the perception is that you know you're rich Americans, and then you're appropriating our culture while we're living in poverty. 
And so that is another uh, challenge there. But it does get you know, a lot of interest because we have the privilege to, um, to do our cultural practice and also innovate and all these things, but it does make its way um, back home. And you know, I intentionally, you know, while we practice this um, writing or this culture, we have to support the others, so otherwise you'd be hypocrites, right? There's one tribe left in the Philippines, so if we don't help them preserve it, then you know, who are we to say that, yeah, enjoy this writing system while we're not economically taking care of the folks back home. Gosh, um, maybe, you know, because there's a lot more support in Iran for, for calligraphy, it seems that an, uh, an associated challenge is maybe in innovation or modernizing or kind of taking it outside of maybe a traditional practice. Can you talk a little bit about ways that you've seen um, the tradition specifically coming from Iran um, you know, change or develop? Yeah, very good question. So I think um, probably from 200 years ago when, you know, the kind of the way of modern public publicizing or publishing introduced to Iran from, from Europe, um, I think calligraphers understood that their career is either going to die or, you know, they have to either compete with the, you know, um, modern technique, you know, techniques and publishing techniques, or they have to uh, find new ways of continuing their art and their career. So I think from that point, calligraphy in, in Iran or many of the probably Middle Eastern societies um, turned into, you know, art. Um, so being being a very very highly respected art form rather than um, something that you use just for for the function of writing and um, like legal documents or official documents or those kind of things or just copying books and, and then this was kept um, alive uh, till probably 10-15 years ago so people would go through you know traditional and classic uh, training and they would uh, really respect that training and would try to keep uh, the calligraphy script that uh, they would learn and try to you know, not changing it at all or adding a little bit of flavor to it. So sometimes when you compare many of the master's pieces, you might not understand much of the difference unless you are, you know, a professional artist or calligrapher or understand calligraphy. So many of them might look like the same because they're, they're following the similar tradition and they, they are not supposed to change it, but they add a little bit of flavor or signature to it. But then, um, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you know, again, another modern movement and internet and, you know, Western art, abstract art. And then calligraphy faced another challenge, which was uh, either to continue as traditional art or, you know, and you would, use, you would lose your, you know, younger audiences or even, you know, Western audiences, or um, you could combine it probably with the modern art. So another type of style kind of born, and it's, it is the combination of painting and calligraphy. And um, it is the usage of you know, painting techniques and visual art techniques in calligraphy. And many of them are becoming many abs very abstract that you can't even read the text. And it's, it's just the um, abstract artwork, but it has you know, writing as a foundation uh, in a way which is taking off in auctions around the world and some of them are being sold millions of dollars and it's, yeah, yeah. So it seems there is an interest um, in, in the kind of modernization of the traditional calligraphy, but it's still the traditional calligraphy, I guess, has its own values. I mean, you've all talked a little bit about the effect of the digital age um, on your work. Um, and I'd like you maybe to say a little bit more about how you see um, how you see the practice evolving further? I mean, the digital world, the, you know, this age we live in has seemed to broaden your audiences and brought you inspiration. Um, but it's also an age in which younger people uh, less and less are even writing by hand and uh, communicating by emojis, right? So, where do you see things going from here? Well. We ponder this on a regular basis. <laughs> I, I think today, you could ask me tomorrow, today, I think the craft is dying. I think that's where the answer is. 
Um, the art is advancing, and we argue is calligraphy an art or a craft. I don't know if you do this in your cultures. For, for us, it's, it seems to be a topic of conversation. It has been for years. Um, and it's both. There's no doubt about that. And my part, I tend to gravitate, as you saw from uh, my influences, more at the craft end. Um, there's not a lot of innovation. There's um, clean, solid work is what we're looking for. Um, to be a good artist, you need to have craft. You need to have uh, knowledge of your tools and your mediums and such. But um, legibility is much less important. And, and uh, I think on the high end of abstract art, craft is an important part of it. But what I see on the internet and what I see, unfortunately, coming out of uh, a lot of modern calligraphy is um, not enough instruction of, unfortunately for some, for many, you have to go back to that Roman alphabet. You can look at Thomas Engmeyer's most modern work and it is absolutely derived from, you know, it's like rock and roll is derived from, you know, classic music. I mean, it, it all, you know, perpetuates and, and moves forward. And um, today, uh, I note that about 40 to 50 percent of our period of the work in our periodicals is illegible. You can't read it, but that's the design. It's working with letters, and, and that's just where it's gone. So, um, how we as artists individually embrace that is an individual choice. Um, yeah, I want to ask you a follow up question. So, I, I, on Instagram, I see a lot of um, uh, say, I know in the Philippines, uh, calligraphy from a Roman alphabet perspective is quite popular um, in terms of, I don't know if it's, it, is it, I'm noticing it's almost like, uh, I don't want to say fad, but something akin to getting uh, vinyl records, where um, I know that, you know, we'll have a calligraphy party for, you know, so-and-so's wedding, and then, you know, they'll buy some stuff at Dick Blick's, you know, the, the calligraphy pens, and I've noticed th that, I mean, has... I have, do you notice any of those groups ever like digging deeper into you know what you've mentioned, or do they maybe tend to stay within, you know this, you know glitter calligraphy? <laughs> uh, th there is crossover, <laughs> and and, and um, my background comes from a strong guild tradition, and and I think all the guilds in the United States um, have uh, most of them are forty years old or so or, or newer. And most of the founding people and the influential people in these guilds, um, I think, fortunately, draw from a traditional perspective and keep that growth. It is the influence of Instagram and Tumblr and all those that there's just a lot of stuff out there that people can get their hands. It's dangerous when a non-calligrapher gets a tool in their hand <laughs> and makes letters. It, and they're terrible from somebody who studied their whole life, yet their reaction to the digital age, their reaction to, to, strict, to, to real tight digital type. So if it's got a lot of loops on it and it's a little bumpy and a little squiggly, it's okay. And I think for those who study uh, calligraphy, it's not okay. But, you know, that's a judgmental, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to add uh, one small thing um, about Brick's point about craft um, dying. And I think it's it's kind of, uh, it's the question of uh, not just craft and art, but, you know, traditional art versus um, the modern art. And I think the traditional art uh, is kind of fading away, or the craft, um, not just because of the tools or modern age technology, but, but it's more affected by by our lifestyles and uh, the way we are living. So when you're practicing a traditional art, um, it's, it's not just the art or the craft that you're making, it's, it's the whole process of becoming someone else. It's, it's the journey of your lifetime, um, becoming kind of one with your craft and what, with one, with the, with the message you're conveying. And most of the time you have to you know, study with a with a apprentice. You know, go through a pr apprenticeship uh, journey with someone with a master who teaches you not just the art, but the the art of living, the art of you know being a human being, the ethics. You know, it's it's just uh, the whole journey. And our modern life just took all of that away from us. There there's no time for any of that. You have to you know, boom boom boom, create artwork. You know, go to the exhibitions. 
sell the art for the economic value. So um, um, I don't know if there is any solution to that. At some point, maybe people will look back and see there were, there, there were so many values in that and appreciate that. But I don't know, maybe we are at the age of that. <laughs> or yeah, I think within within my context of digital age, um, I started. I would say I started out digital. I mean, always you know writing pen and paper or you know sharpies, um, but I really got out there you know because of the internet, um, and so it was around 2007. So you know I had the first website you know um, specifically around this, and so it's kind of like all right, I can do whatever I want, right? Because you know whoever has the most hits and you know uh, whoever shows up on the first three on Google, you know, you're the one, right? So we, I had that opportunity and, you know, with my, um, the two other folks that I work with, I mean, we really had, you know, the, the um, I guess the vision of creating, you know, this organization and, you know, we did it. So, and that was in 2007 and we would teach, our goal was ultimately to get more exposure for this writing system. And then, you know, we were, honestly, we were making a lot of money on commissions. And then as we started teaching people, I tell people this all the time, you know, we were going good, and then around 2012, down. And that was because the uh, promotion of the writing system, you know, was good. So they didn't need us anymore, you know? So we were putting ourselves out of business. And so that um, forced us to diversify. So how can we do, be different, you know? And then, you know, then other, these younger, newer writers started doing these fancier things, and, you know, they have more free time because they're living at home, and they started to innovate, and then we would get mad. No, you gotta do this, but, you know, there's room for it all, but since there's not that many writers um, of this, you know, there we try and all right, we're gonna be doing the traditional ones. We'll leave the innovation stuff to the you know to the kids, but um, me personally, I, I like to innovate, and you know, I've done some stuff with VR where you know I would write something in virtual reality. Let's say you write the you know um, the word um, a poem. And then now imagine stepping into that poem, into that world, on the context of that. So there are a lot of things. Living here in the Bay Area, too, you know, you, there's, you know, the techie guys, you know, they get a bad rap, I get it. Um, but there are some things, you know, if we can work in conjunction with them to kind of, um, whether from, you know, the economics, because they're here to stay, they're here, you know, um, and trying to figure out how we can, you know, be happy together and benefit, because, you know, bringing analog into digital. Um, but the internet, I mean, is, something that, you know, is, we can't move away from it, but um, if we can get uh, folks to, you know, learn about the tradi traditions and making tools, um, and I think that's how, but everyone doesn't have, you know, they say they don't have time, they don't have patience, they just want to Netflix and chill and all of that stuff, but, I mean, if you, you can tap into, you know, the value, whether it's the cultural value and social value and even economic value, then you'll see people, like, really invest, because, just with like fashion, there's this movement called slow fashion. You know, maybe there's like slow writing. Maybe we can start that, right? <laughs> Thanks. I'd like to open it up to the audience. If you have any questions. <laughs> yeah, the calligraphers, the participating artists, if maybe you have any responses to the questions we've asked. Um, I can speak to that. Um, I think uh, I, I really understand what you're saying. Um, in in my tradition, I think people are very um, um, accepted and accept, and they have they have a huge range of acceptance um, about other people on you know learning their tradition. Um, I have many instances that American calligraphers learned Persian calligraphy, and they were invited to conferences and things in Iran, and people really appreciated. Yeah, yeah, but um, the the point is, uh, if if you're tr if you're practicing traditional calligraphy, you have to be really good at traditional calligraphy. Uh, so it doesn't matter if you're from somewhere else, but if if you are really mastering those strokes and you know those nuances and details, uh, you're accepted. But if if you're making you know a lot of errors or changes or you know you're not sticking to that classical kind of way of practicing it or or implementing it, then um, yeah, traditional calligraphers wouldn't accept your piece as a calligraphy. They they would say it's it's not a calligraphy. 
So, um, yeah, I, I think the line is not, you know, where you're from, but how you're implement, implementing your skills. I don't know. If uh, I want to ask you, Arash, do you, um, how would I put this? Uh, I was talking about Instagram and Tumblr, and, and it's uh, mostly tends to be with a pointed pen in America where people can just pick up one of those pointed pens, learn how to add pressure, and this stuff has no basis, no historical basis that they're even trying to move forward from. Does that exist in Iran? Do you have just, what would you call it, unpurposefully bad calligraphy that's prevalent? <laughs> No, I think most of them, at least the ones that were presented in the film, they have very huge and strong historical background that you can't easily take, you know, take them away or start changing them. Unless you're your artist, you're claiming I'm not a calligrapher, I'm, I'm just using calligraphy as, as a tool of, you know, expressing my artistic expression. And that's that's acceptable because in art you can do anything. But you know when you you say I'm a calligrapher, you, it means that you're following some kind of specific script and techniques and you know history. Um, I've seen new masters who have been master in one script and then they try to design a new script and invent a new one, but not much luck being accepted in the traditional. A spectrum, but and they have ex they have been accepted uh, from younger generation who mm -hmm. appreciate you know a new script is coming to life and it's not a font but it's it's a calligraphy script. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how, can, can I just throw questions yeah, out? Because the same question yeah, for you. Yeah, do, yeah. So, do, do you see so, so you've re revived this mm -hmm. script? and young people are picking up on it, do you see much of people who address it without a whole lot of attention to detail and and take it in the wrong direction? Uh, yeah, all, all the time, because, you know, just just the tattoo example, right? You know, um, it's very cosmetic, but we all start at a cosmetic level, um, and we do see it, you know? So the argument I always tell them is that, why are you getting this? You know, say if you're Filipino, yeah, because I'm proud of my culture, blah blah blah. But you won't take five minutes to learn the basics, right? Mm -hmm. And call it out. You know, it's a call out, right? Um, and you know, sometimes it's you know can cause some issues, but you know that's the burden that I'll take, yep. right? Um, but but to talk about the you know what what you mentioned, that was a great question. Um, I think I can see that happening within the Bayan within my. Uh, cultural practice um, as well. Um, I can see, because I see it with other cultural practices. Um, I'll take one for example. So Philippine martial arts, um, it's Kali. Um, there's probably only less than five or so grand masters, you know, of that are probably in their 80s, 70s, 80s. There's only a few. Um, what happens, you know, their students, you know, people will take their seminars, you know, some guy from England, per se, will take a couple seminars from a, um, a master, and then all of a sudden, um, John's Cowley Institute chain um, it, all over Europe, right? And then, you know, then, then they'll get it, right? You know, they'll, they're will they making the money, but then they'll take out the cultural context. So I think that, um, I think from an artistic standpoint, yeah, everyone can do whatever they want, right? Um, but I think that um, some folks, I mean, like myself, and, you know, you have to be, I don't want to say sensitive and being PC and all that, but there is a sting, right? You know, so you have to kind of be aware of that, you know, of the backlash. But you know, for in our practice, I think it would be great. And I would think that, you know, I've always said, you know, if if there was um, success, would be if we see like our writing system on a T-shirt on Target. If it's at Target, you know, we'll see it because we see it with different writing system. Like you go to Uniqlo, you'll see Japanese on on the on there, but most people can't read it. So that means that it's fully not fully accepted, but it's accepted at a commercial standpoint, um, and that's our goal. It may put us out of business or whatever, but you know, like for example, I work with um, the South of Market um, uh, Pilipinas Cultural District. It's the newest cultural district in California, and one of our problems is that. How, in a cultural district, the first thing is a writing system. You go to Japantown, go to Chinatown, you know, you see their writing system. But within the South of Market, there's no more Filipinos there. There's only a handful because of gentrification and moving out. Um, how do we do that? Um, how do we be visible? The first is, you know, a writing system. It's kind of a chicken and egg problem. 
And um, eventually, you know, we have to work with, you know, these uh, realtors and, you know, building owners and all of that. And how do we bring in that cultural context? Um, or maybe, you know, if some folks will just, there's a brand called uh, Super Dry. Um, it, they're in the mall. You, you, you'll see them, they have Japanese characters, but it's wrong. Yeah, it's wrong, and they're not from Japan. They just want to take the aesthetic of cool Japanese fashion and put it on their British label, and you know because the Japanese fashion and culture is you know is in, they say all right, let's just take that and put it on our you know fashion label, um, and so I see those things that can happen within the art world and you know different writing systems because writing systems are associated with a culture, um, so it's it's a, it's a gray area I think. Um, but um, in terms of art, I think if you, you know, you're upfront and transparent about, you know, your influences and intention, um, you know, I think that is uh, the best way to go. Thanks. Yes. That's a very good question. Um, comic book art, um, I don't know, it's not huge in, in Iran. I, I, um, most of the comic books that we were reading when we were growing up were, you know, translated from other places. So, um, and most of them were using just fonts, um, not huge in, you know, calligraphy being represented in them or being designed culturally in, in our society. And graffiti um, is very new in, in Iran, at least as, as far as I know. I've been reading a book about, um, you know, graffiti in the world. And um, it seems very few of graffiti artists who are well known are coming in general from, from Middle East, uh, and few of them are from Iran. Um, so it's, it's very new, um, I think, um, avenue or, or medium for calligraphers to, um, to discover. And I, I haven't tracked actually um, a huge, you know, um, kind of influence from graffiti to calligraphy. There's, reverse, um, so there's for sure influence from calligraphy to graffiti, and they're kind of, you know, the graffiti artists are liberating themselves from just the rules and techniques, but using calligraphy as a starting point and adding their own personal flavors to it. Um, but maybe in few years, we can see the reverse, right, uh, influence as well. Yeah, but it might be more in English calligraphy or Filipino. I don't know. N neither one influenced me in my own art, but um, I have strong feelings about uh, graffiti is as much good as bad, and a lot of it I think is absolutely wonderful and innovative, and I'm just blown away by it. Um, sorry, I hate the vandalism part. Just totally hate it. <laughs> You know, um, I wish there were more venues for people, or I wish people who did that art would maybe seek more venues where they'd be accepted and not having to paint on things that, you know, it's not their property. Um, where I, I certainly uh, am drawn to some graffiti that I think is just fantastic graphic art, and I stare at it and wonder how they got there. But um, personally, no influence whatsoever, and I read a lot of comic books as a kid. Um, didn't even enter my mind. Yeah, so, um, yeah, graffiti is a big influence. Um, uh, I don't vandalize anymore. <laughs> but um, the, yeah, I mean, one of the, what's interesting, um, when I was a kid, I used to go, uh, go to school in the East Bay, and I would go to Oakland A's games. And, you know, when you go on BART, you see that whole row of the warehouses of graffiti. And I would see one, it's a dream. And I would see it all over the place. And then I, and I remember trying to copy his um, calligraphy style. And um, when I went to the, you know, I went to Philippines, did my thing there. And when I came back, I had a little bio at an event, and um, I mentioned that, yeah, when I first saw Dream, you know, that's kind of what inspired me to do graffiti and things like that. And then um, this guy walked up to me, and says, "Oh, I saw you wrote Dream on there. You know, that's my brother. He's Filipino." I said, "I never knew that." Yeah, you know, cool. so it, it made this, you know, connection. Um, but in terms of calligraphy and graffiti, there's a there's a movement. Um, if you search for the hashtag Kali Graffiti get it yeah. Yeah. yeah you'll see a lot um, one uh, Neil Schumann I think he's from Amsterdam he's good um, so you'll see a lot of that you know um, popping up uh, in terms of comic books um, yeah I mean in terms of the you know the the old school Batman bam and you know those kind of fascinated me but I was over at the um, at the San Francisco comic convention over Labor Day weekend at Moscone and they have these uh, 
covers of like Spider-Man and X-Men that are blank covers. And I bought a few, so okay, now I can do some calligraphy on these covers. So that, that's my influence there. Thanks, and the last question before we wrap up the panel is, uh, what's inspiring you right now and what are you working on at the moment? What's inspiring you? <laughs> I'm thinking. Yeah. yeah, I can start, okay, yeah. So um, I've been I've been collaborating with a ceramic artist, Faris Les Middleton in Petaluma, and um, have been trying to uh, implement calligraphy um, into ceramics. And it has been beautiful two or three years of collaboration and um, a very good opportunity for me to discover this new medium. And it's very different from writing on a paper or on a canvas, uh, which is more fragile and you don't anticipate it to last long, but ceramic is just, you know, could be internal. And it's very different when you write on a ceramic piece or transfer your calligraphy into ceramic piece. So uh, we're honored to have uh, an open re opening reception in late October in ICCNC in Oakland, and I invite all of you to be there. And, uh, and the beautiful thing about it is we are creating uh, ceramic wares and people are gonna eat off of them, not just viewing them. So <laughs> it would be you know, functional pieces like the ones we've been showing in the film, but bringing you know, the, the content and meaning into everyday life that when you're, you're eating, you're revealing the poetry that is under your food or you're revealing a message that is under your uh, your food, so it's it's a feast for 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 your physical body and your your mind and spirit. So I'm so excited about. It. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, yeah. So uh, over the next yeah this next month I'm gonna be traveling doing um, talks um, in uh, Houston, LA, San Diego. But um, in the interim, I think in like in I want to say the end of this month or. F uh, October 1 or 2, there's the uh, International Filipino American uh, Book Festival here at the library for, I think, Friday to Sunday. Um, so I'll be taking part of that, um, uh, talking about the, um, the writing and, you know, doing some custom work. Um, but from a bigger picture, the projects I've been working on are opening up an online school um, for the writing. Because um, there's no schools, we don't have a cultural immersion school like other, um, other folks have. Um, so the best way I see it is to do it online um, and to see where that expands. But I'm, you know, from an art perspective, I've been working um, at the uh, um, this, uh, SOMA um, Cultural District. We put in an event every uh, third Friday of the month at the Old Mint um, on Fifth and Mission. Um, so on f this past Friday, you know, I've been doing um, big pieces, you know, big scroll paper about 30 feet long, um, wall to floor. Um, and you know, just explaining and talking to it, but um, in collaboration with others, and um, you know, just experimenting. You know, having that um, child's mind, and you know, seeing where I can screw up, and you know, try and recover and repeat that cycle. Excuse me. My work uh, today is inspired by, uh, as I said, nature, and uh, a lot of that is driven by um, what I did leave Washington D.C. Uh, I figured I had written what other people want me to write that I didn't always believe for so many years. And when I came here to California that I would um, try to advocate for nature and to write things that, that I more believed in. And that has taken me, as I said, these words, I've probably opened myself up to be directed by these words. I'm not uh, restricted by what I know so much as um, being moved by this text that I write. For instance, there's a um, short quote by uh, John Muir that I'm trying to work on right now that uh, celebrates uh, water as it cascades down a waterfall and works through the mountains to the ocean. And the only vision I came up with was this Chinese landscape painting, Sumi painting. So I find myself having to learn a whole different discipline. And um, that whole journey has been so exciting in taking me into wood and stone and sand and uh, places that I didn't think I would go, but always letters being the un uniting force. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, guys. Well, this wraps up this portion of, of the event, but it's an event that keeps on giving, so there's more of it from three to five. Um, but a couple of announcements before we move the program up. Uh, November 5th, there is a calligraphy day um, that happen is happening here in the library, the same lower level, I think, just across the um, hall there. So we have two local calligraphy masters, Ronald uh, Nakasoni and Meredith Jane Klein, and one international master, Akimi Lucas from the UK. Um, they're all really amazing, so I encourage you all to come here and see their demonstrations. Um, and lastly, I want to just acknowledge that this exhibition was made possible with the support from various organizations, uh, including Friends of the Public Library, Zia Art Center, Friends of Calligraphy, Multiverse Art Gallery, Semena Circle, Persian Arts Revival, Oakland Asian Cultural Center, the Islamic Cultural Center of Northern California, the California School of Traditional Arts, and Silkworm Media. Thank you to our technicians, Rich and our photographer today. And um, thank you to the artists who are here. Um, you'll get a chance to hear from them directly and from, from these three on the panel more when we go upstairs. Um, so what's happening will be a few minutes to kind of make your way up there. There, uh, it's on the sixth floor, sixth floor. But to get there, you can either take the stairs up one floor to take the elevators up or take the elevators up one floor, go through the uh, gates, and then take another elevator up. So it's a, a two-step process to get upstairs. There will be some light refreshments. And then um, the curators and artists are going to lead you through. So you'll have a chance to ask personal questions and kind of work, go through the exhibition with the artists that are here. So it's a great opportunity. So please stick around. Refreshments as well and refreshments. So there's really no reason to leave. Um, really not at all. So see you guys all upstairs. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs>